Amen. Thanks. Do you struggle to pray? I know sometimes when I pray, my mind starts to wonder and I end up saying the same dry phrases that don't even apply in the context at all. I'll be praying for my mum who um, is not Christian and um, I'll suddenly find myself saying something like, yeah, Lord, I just pray that you'll speak to her through your word as she reads it each day. And then I suddenly stop myself and I think, she doesn't read the Bible. She's not a Christian. What am I saying? And I'll, I'll, I realize I'm just saying something that I say for Christian friends and I pray for them. But maybe it's a not mindless praying that you struggle with. Maybe it's um, constant petition, but no joy. You ask God for things, but you just, it just become, it's just become a bit of a box ticking exercise. Or worse yet, perhaps sometimes you just don't know what to pray at all or how to pray at all. Do you struggle to pray? Well, we're continuing our series on prayer today. And I wonder how you found it since you started, whether you feel like you pray more now than before, or whether you, whether you find that you enjoy pray, prayer more now than you did at the beginning of the series. And even if the answer to both those questions is a resounding yes, and it's okay, by the way, if it's not, if it's not a resounding yes, we can still acknowledge, can't we, that prayer can be difficult. It's not exactly something that you can teach someone um, really easily. I've heard it said that prayer is something that is caught, not taught. And perhaps that's why when Jesus um, prayed and the disciples saw him praying and they asked him, um, please teach us how to pray. Uh, rather than giving them a long lecture on how to pray, he just gave them the Lord's Prayer. He gave them words that they could say in prayer. David was a great prayer. He wrote 73 psalms, spirit-filled, heartfelt songs of praise and lamentation and thanks and confession. Perhaps every posture of the human heart towards God can be found in David's prayers. Wouldn't you love to pray more like David, a man after God's own heart, he was called. But the psalms aren't the only place that we find David's prayers. And today we're going to focus on one of um, his prayers at the kind of height of his spiritual maturity and depth of faith in God in 1 Chronicles 29. It's an exciting time in Israel's history. David's son Solomon has just, is almost going to be made king of Israel, then take over leadership of the nation of Israel from his, his father David. And there's just been a huge um, offering gathered from the people um, to, of Israel to go towards the construction of the temple, the first massive glorious temple where God would dwell in a special way. And wealthy King David has been saving up for a long time for this. He is, he's really excited about this. He had wanted to, um, to build it in his own lifetime, but God had told him, no, no, I want, I want your son Solomon to be the one to build the temple. And so um, that's what he had been saving up for. And it, we're gonna, that's basically the context of, of 1 Chronicles um, chapter 28 and 29. And we're going to be focusing on 10 verses, which um, basically is David's prayer um, after this offering has been given by the, by the Israelites. And that's from verse 10 to 20. And I'm going to pass over to Bev now, who's going to bring our reading. So there's going to be those 10 verses from 1 Chronicles 29. David's prayer. David praised the Lord in the presence of the whole assembly, saying, Praise be to you, Lord, the God of our father Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor, for everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You're exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. Now, our God, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. But who am I and who are my people that we should be able to give as generously as this? Everything comes from you and we have given you only what comes from your hand. We are foreigners and strangers in your sight, as were all our ancestors. Our days on earth are like a shadow without hope. Lord, our God, all, the abund all this abundance that we may have that we have provided for building you a temple for your holy name comes from your hand, and all of it belongs to you. I know, my God, that you rest, you test the heart, and are pleased with integrity. 
all things I have given willingly and with honest intent. And now I have seen with joy how willingly you people who are here have given to you. Lord, the God of our fathers, Abraham, Isaac and Israel, keep these desires and thoughts in the hearts of the, your people forever and keep their hearts loyal to you. And give my son Solomon the wholehearted devotion to keep your commands, statutes and decrees and to do everything to build the palatial structure for which I have provided. Then David said to the whole assembly, Praise the Lord your God. So they all praised the Lord, the God of their fathers. They bowed down, prostrating themselves before the Lord and the King. Thanks very much, Bev. Let me just encourage you to keep um, your Bibles open at that passage. It's really helpful if you can see the passage. That way, that you can, that way you can test um, what I'm saying, if it's faithful to the passage, and it means that you'll get the most out of the message. I think it's a great thing to do in general, by the way, um, when you listen to talks, to have the Bible open in front of you and be reading it uh, while you're listening to the talk. Um, what can we learn from David's prayer? That's the question we're going to be asking ourselves today. If prayer is caught, not taught, how can we catch a better sense of how to pray well from David's prayer? Well, he begins with praise saying who God is and how great he is. Praise be to you, Lord, he says, the God of our father Israel. From everlasting to everlasting, yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor. These words of praise are like many others we find throughout the Psalms, and they particularly reminded me of two passages that we find in the book of Revelation. In chapter 4, verse 11, the elders fall down before him who sits on the throne, and they say, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they were created and have their being and likewise in chapter 5 john who wrote the book of revelation writes this then i looked and heard the voice of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands and ten thousand times ten thousand they encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders and in a loud voice they were saying worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and the lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. Words of praise like these all have a few things in common. They describe God with various names and titles. They recount what he's done for his people and they give descriptions of who God is and, and how great he is. Why does David begin his, his prayer with this, with this praise? Well, just think back to the last time that you heard Mary pray. Okay? When Mary prays, she often, she often begins by praising God, using names and titles of God that, that we can find in the Bible, like Lamb of God and Wonderful Counselor. She thanks God for what, for what um, he's done for us. And when she glorifies God in her prayers like this, don't you just find your heart tune in more intensely to her prayer you, you almost find yourself saying amen and you find yourself more easily able to engage with the prayer when it begins with praise like that and when maybe when you begin with praise yourself in your own prayer don't you just find yourself more confident and in the goodness of god and more expectant um, of his response doesn't it give you a boldness to in asking for prayer for things in your prayer later on praising god is good for us it's what we're made for and it's what we're called to. It helps us be more confident in prayer. But praising God isn't even supposed to be about us or how it benefits us. It's supposed to be how we give glory to God and how um, we can. It's because he deserves it. He is worthy of our praise. Acknowledging him as the giver of all good things and praising him for it. For everything in heaven and earth is yours, David says. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. Now, our God, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. So praise and thanks is how David begins his prayer here. And it's something that we can learn from. It's not to say that every prayer has to begin like this or be structured like David's prayer. We're just looking at one model of prayer here in the Bible. 
But it's worth asking ourselves how much we praise and thank God and thank God in our in our times of prayer, both private and publicly. After all, what might it reveal about how we um, relate to God, how we think about God, and thank Him um, if if we didn't praise and thank Him in our in our prayer? It'd be a bit like going to the theatre or a musical or or a school play, and um, you arrive with your family and friends. You find your seats and wait for the show to begin. The curtains open. The show is spectacular, like nothing you've ever seen before. You, you can't believe the skill of the performers on stage. The number of hours they must have rehearsed. Everyone else in the venue feels the same way. They're blown away. And yet when the final scene is over and all the, and all the performers come out on the stage and they're bowing before the audience, you and everyone else around you are just like statues, your hands in your lap, the face is expressionless. The curtains are drawn and everyone gets up and everyone just leaves. That'd be pretty weird, wouldn't it? It'd be pretty weird not to, not to clap and, and, and praise the, the performers for the great spectacular work they've done. And after all God has done for us in Christ, after all, he does, after all that he does for us now in providing for us, in, in um, how, what he, how he um, is with us and, and provides such good things, family, friends, um, all, all the things that we do have, um, wouldn't it be weird if we didn't praise him and thank him? Worse than that, wouldn't it be wrong? Even more wrong than not clapping at the end of that spectacular show. We need to learn to praise and thank God, as David has done, does in this passage. And the best way to do that is just to start doing it. Even if it feels awkward and, and um, forced at first, the more we dig into the Bible and reflect on, on what the Lord has done for us, the more we reflect on all that he does for us today, the easier it will be. So the next, we've looked at the praise in David's prayer. The next part of David's prayer is between verses 14 and 17. And here we find something of a confession. David acknowledging his own place, his own and his people's place before God. Who am I, he asks, and who are my people that we should be able to give as generously as this? When I say confession, I don't mean that David is saying sorry for all the, the things that he's done or the, the way that he's li he lives. Uh, it's not a confession of sin, but it's more like a confession of faith. It's acknowledging the truth. And it's all said in view of who God is, from what David has said before in verses 10 to 13. Since all wealth and honor and strength come from the Lord, David confesses his own weakness and dependence on God. Even though he's very wealthy, he's the king of Israel after all. In comparison with God, his wealth and significance is minuscule. It's a bit like comparing the earth and the universe. However massive the earth is, and we can make documentaries about it, like on planet earth and everything, when you begin to describe and consider how big the universe is, the earth suddenly looks pretty tiny. It's like that when we praise God. Once we've thought about how big God is, it makes us realize how small we are. David continues, we are foreigners and strangers in your sight, he says, as were all our ancestors. Our days on earth are like a shadow without hope. It takes humility to admit that we have no natural claim to God's provision. We don't have any right to what God provides for us. It's by his grace that we have anything. And David recognizes and acknowledges God, that, that before God, um, that without him, he and his people would be nobodies, nobodies with no hope. And it's important for us to recognize this too and acknowledge, in our own, and acknowledge it in our own prayer life before God. Not only will it give us an honest assessment of our natural state before God, but when we realize how small we are compared to him, God's love for us is even more amazing. So we've seen praise, seen confess, praise and thanks, confession um, of truth, confession of faith, um, and the final part of David's prayer is probably the kind of prayer that we're most familiar with. It's um, petition, asking for things. Many people who don't even know God or follow Jesus are familiar with this kind of prayer. We've all met people who, when things are going badly, um, have prayed, have, have asked, asked God for help, asked him to act in some way in their life. But as soon as they're back on their feet again, God is a distant memory. And we ourselves can be like that sometimes, can't we? We can just forget all about God. Um, and when it's when it's going well a, a prayer life that focuses on petition alone is a poor one but petition is a fundamental part of a good and healthy prayer life 
The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their cry. That's what it says in Psalm 34. God loves to listen to our requests. Jesus encouraged us to ask God for things and to expect God to, to respond and to, to give us things. But we're also encouraged to pray according to God's will, not just whatever takes our fancy. And that's what David does here. Israel had just been incredibly generous in, in bringing forth all this, um, these offerings that they, bring, that they brought for the temple construction. And David prays, keep these desires and thoughts in the hearts of your people forever and keep their hearts loyal to you. The people had given willingly. That's what we see in chapter 28 and 29, stressed again and again that they, they did it willingly. Um, and since they'd given willingly, this desire of theirs to build God's house had been on the hearts of the people. David prays that those desires might continue, might remain. And then he says, give my son Solomon the wholehearted devotion to keep your commands, statutes and decrees and to do everything to build the palatial structure for which I provided. A generous offering and a, and a, and a king of Israel with wholehearted devotion. Those, those two things are exactly the kind of thing that God would have wanted. David knows what God desires, what is God's will, because he knows his God. And so, like David, our prayers too, our prayers of petition, we're asking for things, should be in line with God's will. They should focus on what matters most from an eternal perspective. It's fine and good to pray for someone's healing, but much better to pray that through someone's healing, they might treasure God more. They might, may, they might really appreciate God and, and grow closer in their relationship with him. Or through their healing, people around them might, might be intrigued and want to know more about the God of, of healing, that God heals. It's fine to pray for a new car, but much better to pray that in receiving a new car from God, you might be able to serve others and fulfill your calling. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom. And that should be our priority in prayers of petition. Finally, after David finishes praying, he commands the people to praise the Lord your God. And that's exactly what they did. One thing to notice from this final verse is that it says they bowed down and prostrated themselves which could mean that they like kind of knelt down or, or lay down before God as they worshipped him. In the ESV, a different translation, says that they bowed their heads. In my opinion, it's not entirely clear like what exactly they did with their body, but what is clear is that they did something with their body, whether it was bowing their heads or, or kneeling or, or lying down. And I'm not saying that the Bible teaches that we must do this when we pray, not at all, but it is something that we find from time to time throughout the Bible accompanied with prayer and of worship, a bodily expression of worship. I don't know how much you do this, if at all. I don't do it very often, but it, I think it is something worth trying because from my experience, I found it really helpful. It's a really helpful thing to do. You know, um, body language experts, they say that um, before you go into an interview, um, to feel confident, you should practice power poses in the toilet, like doing this with your hands, and standing with your shoulders back and your hands on your hips and these, these things just with your body you can make yourself feel more confident um, just because you're, you're kind of those things are associated, associated with confidence and um, with, with prayer and worship it can be similar we can we can use um, bodily expressions of praise and worship bowing our head kneeling and this can better help us to enter a worshipful mindset and it's also a way of giving God the glory and honor as we humble ourselves, um, not only in, in our words, but also in our physical um, as well. So we've looked at some of the different elements of David's prayer. We've, and, and I've encouraged us to learn um, from it. We've seen that he praises God in, in, in prayers, to, that he thanks God, that he confesses his own weaknesses and dependence on God. And um, to ask for things that, that God is eager to give according to his will. There's one last practical thing that we can take away. Um, that we can, the one way that can, we can use this prayer. It's something I did uh, quite regularly with this prayer a few months ago. Um, just before lockdown. And it's something that Julian encouraged us to do last week with the Psalms. I'm talking about praying through it. Using the language and structure of the prayer to shape your own prayers making the prayer your own, personalizing it, piggybacking off this prayer. 
if I was to pray um, this prayer before a, an exam, for example, I'd start by having my Bible open in front of me, my eyes scanning the page, my head bowed, and I'd say something like this. I praise you, Lord, because you are worthy of all praise forever and ever. Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor. All intelligence comes from you. There is no clever thought that you haven't had already. There is no exam you couldn't pass. You are the ultimate judge, and it's up to you to give and take away exam results. Lord, who am I that you should give me this opportunity to take this exam and receive this education? I don't deserve your favour, but you give it to me anyway because you're kind and compassionate and want the best for me. I know, my God, that you test the heart and are pleased with integrity. Help me, Father, to do well in this in my exam. Help me to do it to the best of my ability, the ability you've given me. Thank you that you've given me the abilities I have and the memory I have. Help me to remember what I've revised. I pray, Lord, not only will I pass this exam, but through passing it, you might lead me on to greater things, that I might live a life which pleases you and uses my qualifications for the good of your kingdom and the honour of your name. Amen. Now, of course, if I was to use this prayer um, in the Bible, while, if I was struggling with anger or about to confront uh, or talk to a difficult friend or before reading the Bible, the words that I use, how I kind of personalise the prayer and the structure of the prayer, and kind of what, what bits of the prayer that I take will be different. Um, but if I was struggling to pray or, or just needed some inspiration from biblical prayer, turning to this one could be a real help. And as I say, it doesn't have to be this one. There are 150 Psalms in the Bible that you could use. There are loads of um, prayers in the New Testament, especially in um, some of Paul's letters. Um, there, there are others, other prayers in the Old Testament as well. I'm no expert in this. I've done it a few times and I found it to be really beneficial. But I, hope, I do hope to do it more and more as I, grow, as I grow in prayer over the years. I often struggle to pray and perhaps you do too. So I hope you'll take something from today um, about how to pray and try it and implement it and, uh, in your own prayer life. And um, let me know how it goes. I'd be really interested to know um, if you benefit from, from some of the different things that I've said today. And um, I think we're now going to pass on over to Julian. Is that right? Let me just, I'm just going to finish a prayer. Lord God, thank you for your word. Thank you for this prayer in 1 Chronicles 29. Thank you. Um, that it is something of a model for us to, to offer you praise um, and, um, and confession and um, to have a petition that is in line with your word and, and in um, accordance with your will. We just praise you that you've, that you've preserved your word over these years. We praise you that you, you love us and um, have revealed um, yourself to us in your word. And um, we pray that you will help us to be better prayers, that we will... Um, we will take something from, from this and that we will um, honour you more and more in our prayers as we grow in prayer um, throughout the rest of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.